Well, hey, listen, I'm super excited about tonight's message. We are in our, our Christmas of Destiny series, uh, and we've been going through and studying these different terms and kind of doing a word study as we study some of these terms for Advent. And this last weekend, we talked about hope, and we kind of d- dove into some of the, the scriptural references for hope uh, and, and kind of defined some of those words. And I kind of want to unpack that a little bit more tonight. I want to look at that a little bit more. I want to talk about hope a little bit more and, and kind of look at what it means and, and look at some different characters and some stories. And so... So we're just going to kind of walk through it a little bit together. Uh, if you weren't here, or just as a reminder, we kind of looked at three different words for hope. We, we looked at two words in the Old Testament that represented hope, and, and one word in the New Testament that represented hope. So two Hebrew words and one Greek word. And, and what's interesting is the two words for hope in the Old Testament, they both had this context of waiting and expecting and expectantly waiting and and we, we looked at some different verses and we looked at some of the different uh, things and, and we saw how there was only even this this implication of this tense waiting this tension of what waiting looks like that hope many times in the Old Testament was this tense waiting uh, in, in this this process uh, and and I know that like in Isaiah Isaiah talked about it a lot. Uh, in, in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, it says, But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. The, the thing that says tr- the trust is actually the word for hope. Those, those who put their hope in the Lord, those who, who trust in the Lord, those who wait on the Lord will have all those, those things. And, and so we have this concept of waiting and waiting is hard because people don't typically wait. You know, people don't like to wait, especially now. Maybe historically people waited more, but now people don't like to wait. If we don't have to wait for something, we would prefer not to. If we can get something right now, we would prefer it. And, you know, the things who are the worst at waiting is kids. Kids have no idea how to wait, especially young kids, because they don't even have a concept of time. So it's so messed up. So when I tell my five-year-old, like, hey, we're going here in two weeks, like, he can't even comprehend it. He, he's just like, was it, like, now? Like, no, it's not now. How many times do I have to go to sleep? Well, 14. Does that count naps? No. Like, he had it figured out. He's like, I'm going to take three naps today, and we'll get this puppy rolling. I'm like, that's not how it works. It's... It's, t- it's time. I like, I appreciate that. Uh, I should have just let him do it, but it didn't work. It, 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 the, the waiting is, is hard. Waiting is hard. Most of your kids are probably like counting down the days till Christmas. They're super excited, and it's like killing them. Like, oh, my gosh, is it ever going to come? The parents are like, there's not enough time. I needed to slow down. I've got so much stuff to do. But the kids, the, the waiting is hard. Like, the waiting is tough. And sometimes it feels like the closer you get to the result, waiting can be more difficult. And, and so when it comes down to hope, it's, it's hard to say that, that hope has to do with, with waiting, but those two things are inseparable. And, and then the word that is, is in the Greek word, it, it denounces this thing and it, it creates this thing of this expectation of good, that you have this expectation of good happening. You have an expectation of a positive results. And I don't know if you've ever met people who always expect something good to happen to them, like they always walk around like that, they can sometimes be annoying. Like there's people who just expect that everything's always gonna go great for them. Like they're never gonna, like they're the, 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 the most optimistic, they just always think that everything is gonna just go great for them. And in, in some ways, we probably should be more in that mindset because the truth is how you behave changes based on what your expectation is. If you expect that you're going to find good, then many times that's exactly what you'll, you'll find. And if you expect that you're going to find opposition or frustration or whatever, you, you find. There's that principle that many times you find what you're looking for. If you travel, I don't know if anyone's traveled recently, and you just expect there to be problems and you expect there to be difficulties and you expect there to be issues, you'll probably find it. Like someone in security will give you the stink eye. Like, 
somebody will search your bag one too many times. They will run out of ice on your flight. Something will break, like things will just happen. When I got to go to Montana a couple weeks ago, we, we went, and I was supposed to be on a later flight, but I had some friends who were on an earlier flight, and they're like, you should just come and see if they have seats. And I went, and they're like, yeah, we have seats. Get on there. I was like, man, this is great. I'm going to get there early. Everything's great. My bag even got on that flight. I'm like, this is awesome. This is so good. We take off. I'm like, man, this is excellent. We're leaving Denver. We, we take off. We're maybe there, we're in the air maybe 15 minutes at the most, and all of a sudden the pilot comes on, and he's like, hey, uh, we're going to need to turn around and go back to Denver. Uh, there's something wrong with the landing gear. <laughs> to a draw, like, why are you telling us this right now? Uh, and he's like, it, we think it works fine. There's just some steering issues, and so we would rather li- land at Denver than anywhere else, so it's, we think it's fine. We think it's fine, but we're just gonna go check it out. And so I'm like, okay, it's gonna be fine. Well, of course, there's some people who are really stressing out on the plane at this point. Like, there's people who now, their expectations have just changed. They're not expecting a good landing. And apparently neither were they, because when we landed, there were like three fire trucks that were waiting for us, and they literally followed us all the way to the gate. Like, it wasn't like, oh, they landed, it's fine. They literally followed us into the gate. And so, long story short, I ended up being on my original flight. Uh, so, and uh, they ended up landing within 15 minutes of each other when it was all said and done. So, it, uh, it all worked out. But, but what you expect is what you'll, you'll find. And how we perform and how we do things many times is going to be different based on how we expect. You know, I've told a lot of you guys, especially the Wednesday night crew, you guys are the in crew, you know. So, I ran track uh, in, in college. And I ran track in high school and I played soccer and I was always a pretty fast guy. Uh, And so I've had a lot of people in my life like, how did you get fast? How did you, what did you do? How did you practice? Like, what did you do things? And I started really thinking about it because the truth was from a very early age, I was always the fastest kid on my team. I was always the fastest person on my team. And then I, but I started thinking back whenever I would go and run, whether it was for soccer or in a race or at school, like whatever it was, I never, ever, ever even had the thought that someone was going to be faster than me. Ever. I never expected to show up somewhere in second place. Like, ever. Like, it didn't even cross my mind. It wasn't like, and it wasn't like this thought, like, I thought I was better than, like, it just never crossed my mind. So when I was running for something, if we're playing soccer, I'm running for the ball, I never, ever had any expectation that someone would beat me to it. Or ever have an expectation that I couldn't get there. Like, oh, that's pretty far away. You see it all the time. I yell at my kids on my soccer team all the time. Like, if they think they're not going to get there, they just quit. Oh, I'm not going to get there. Well, I was just crazy enough to always expect that I could get there before the person, no matter how far away or how far behind I was. And it changed how I played the game. It changed what the results were. It changed how I did because my expectation was I was never out of, I was always able to catch up. I could always get there. Like how I lived, the expectation was different. When you walk around with an expectation of good on your life, you, you live differently. You, you walk differently. You look for different things. You look around and you expect to see different things. You expect to see favor. You expect for God to show up. And many times we start to see God's goodness when we're looking for it. We, we see God's goodness when we're looking for it. So many times in our process in our lives, we become so focused on specific issues and like, hey, we're asking God for this specific thing. And if he's not answering this specific thing, we're missing all the things in other areas that God's already doing for us and other ways that God's showing up. And so our expectations are, are different. And so based on those couple of words, I wanted to think about and talk about a couple of characters who I think that when we look at them, when we look at their story, we can see how this, this hope and this expectation, it, it fueled who they were. It, it fueled how they lived. The first character that always comes to mind whenever I, I, I think about this, this concept is Abraham. Romans chapter 4 verse 18 says, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. When we think about the story of Abraham, which is obviously, I mean, his life is long, it's lots of chapters. 
he had no reason for hope. He had no reason to expect that God was going to do anything good for him. He had no reason to wait expectantly. we, We talked about that many times in our expectation, you look in the past to know the character of God, but Abraham didn't even have a history with God. Abraham was called out and made a covenant that was brand new. It wasn't like he could say, like, oh, God was good to my father. That, that relationship didn't exist. This was all new for Abraham. Abraham had this thing where he was called to hope, yet everything in his circumstances said there's no hope. God said that he was going to be a father of many nations, and they couldn't have kids and they were old. God said that he was going to give him this property and he had no way to take that land. Like everything about his scenario looked like there should be no expectation of good. There, there's no reason to wait for God to show up because what, what would he do? Yet even in this, just like Romans says, there was no reason for hope but Abraham kept hope, hoping, believing that he would become the father of of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. Now we know, based on Abraham's story, we know that he was not perfect. We know that he made plenty of mistakes. We know that he had plenty of issues. We know that he lied. We know that he kept trying to pawn his wife off as his sister, which I don't know how that worked out very well. Again, it didn't work out very well for him. But he continually in this process, he hoped and he waited. And when you look at it, when he finally has a son and he has Isaac, I think the greatest thing and the greatest part of the hope that he had was even when God asked him to sacrifice his son. And he said, I want you to take your son up and I want you to sacrifice your only son. That even when faced with that dilemma, even when faced with something that, that seems unthinkable, that seems like it's not something that we should ask, which th- seems like it's a, a mistake because he waited so long to receive this promise. He hoped for so long, and then all of a sudden, here he is. And God says that, I want you to sacrifice him. He still was walking through that process. He still was doing it because his hope was still in God. He, he said that, that he believed that God was going to make a way, even if it meant raising up his son from the dead, even if it meant making a way when there was no way. He had an expectation that God had gotten him to this point, that God had already done a miracle in his heart, in his mind, in his body, in his wife's body, and has given to the son, and he is going to continue to hope that God's going to show up. This expectation of good, but we can see in both that not only was there the, the expectation of good, but I'm sure in the moment, in the waiting, into that up to there was very tense. I'm sure he wasn't just like really just happy-go-lucky going up the mountain. I'm pretty sure it was pretty tense. I'm pretty sure it was pretty hard. I'm pretty sure the request that was made on the Father's heart was very difficult. And so we have this, this tense expectation you know, when you do a little word search of the two Hebrew words, the book of the Bible that, that uses them, maybe not the, the most, but one of the most, especially within a singular story, is Job. And when you think about Job's story, this is a guy who probably should have had nothing to hope for. He had everything, and then literally had everything taken away from him. And in, in his story, despite him going through up and downs, and pity parties, he still maintained this thread of hope. He still maintained a thread of hope amongst his friends that even though everything in his natural circumstance looked terrible, his wife, his kids, his property, his flocks, everything is gone. Even in that, he still had a hope that God was going to show up. He still had a hope Doesn't mean he didn't throw a pity party. Doesn't mean he didn't throw a fit. Doesn't mean that he didn't get angry. Because all that stuff happened. But he still had this expectation that God was going to show up. And God showed up. God showed up in ways that that make sense. 
But you know, one of the things when we talk about the waiting, and I think one of the, the things that, to me, in my mind, the character that I think about waiting the most is David. David also used the word hope a lot in Psalms. He wrote about hope all the time. He wrote about my hope, my trust is in God. But I think David understood the concept of the waiting and, and, and the process to the promise because his whole story is about waiting. When he's very young, he gets anointed king of Israel. And it's not like he then gets marched into the palace. He's told to go back and watch the sheep. For years, for years, even after the promise is made and even after there's this hope for the future and even after God's anointing is on him, he then has to wait. And there was many opportunities in his life, especially whenever Saul was towards the end of his reign and and David was on the run and he he knew that David was gonna be the next king and, and he was afraid of him and so he was trying to kill David David had plenty of times that he could have taken the timetable into his own hands. That that David could have killed Saul or David could have sent his men to kill Saul. Like David was more powerful. David had more opportunity. David had the anointing of God. David had every opportunity to do it, but instead he decided to wait. And that's why in the Psalms so many times he'd say, my hope is in the Lord. My hope, my trust, I wait on the Lord. I love this, Psalms 39, seven says, and so Lord, where do I put my hope? My only hope is in you. That in these times, in these times of when he was running, when he was hiding, when he had this promise, when he knew what God was calling him to, he walked and he had to wait. And he waited with this expectation that God was going to do something good. And David, through his whole life, always had an expectation that God was going to do something good. He always had that expectation. When he ran and he had to fight the bear or he had to fight the lion, he expected that God was going to show up. When he had to go against Goliath, he expected that God was going to show up. Whenever he eventually became king, he expected that God was going to show up. Whenever he fell short and he sinned, he still expected that God was going to show up and redeem him. He always expected God to do good towards him, to have mercy towards him, to walk in mercy, so much so that Solomon, when he's having his conversation with God and when he asks for wisdom, he talks about how you always dealt with my father in mercy. He always believed that he was gonna get good from you. Even when he didn't deserve good, he expected good. David did a lot of things that he probably should have died for, that he probably should have been punished with death, yet at no point did he expect anything other than good. He had this hope. He he had this hope in a future. And I think if we fast forward to a to a New Testament example, that in many ways is really challenging to to me. It's it's Paul. Paul is this person who continually talks about putting his hope in God and the hope that we have in Jesus and the hope that we have because of Jesus. But when we look at what Paul lived through, I'm pretty sure none of us would want to go through what Paul went through. None of us would want to go through the arrests, the beatings, the stonings, the shipwrecks, the snake bites, the betrayals, the everything that Paul went through. He went through all of it. And despite everything that we know Paul went through, despite all the issues and all the heartaches and all the difficulties that Paul walked through, he still talks about the hope that we have in Jesus. He still writes the majority of the New Testament. He still talks about the the hope and the expectation of good that we can have because of Jesus. I I love in Romans chapter four, verse 18, it says, or sorry, verse five, or chapter five, verse two, it says, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into a place of undeserving privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look to sharing his glory. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help develop endurance. This endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. 
And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. To me, if I have a bad week, sometimes I can throw a pity party. I can be in a bad mood just because I get cut off in traffic or because I keep hitting the same red light on my way to church every week. Like, it, 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 I, I can get frustrated about things that are not in the grand scheme of things that big of a deal. And yet, Paul, after everything, says, this expectation of God doing good for me will not lead to disappointment. When, when we studied his life, we would think if anyone had a reason to be disappointed with how their life went, in the process of serving God, it probably could have been Paul. At some point, Paul could have said, you know what, God, I'm a little disappointed that this is what keeps happening to me. That everywhere I go, I keep getting stoned and kicked and thrown out of town. I'm a little disappointed. I'm a little disappointed that this has happened. I'm a little disappointed that I'm under arrest so much. It'd be great if that didn't happen. Yet, he says, this hope, this expectation of God doing good towards me will not lead to disappointment because I know how much God loves me. That, that challenges my faith. That challenges my perspective. That, that challenges how I walk on a daily basis. That challenges what the, the patience that I try to walk with with my family and with the things that, that we walk through is that how many times do I get frustrated and angry and irritated and lose hope whenever the, it's the hope that can actually drive me to doing and being the person that I'm supposed to be in that situation. Like how many times do I lose hope when hope is the thing that can actually get me through that difficulty? That because I walk into a difficult situation, because I come to something that's hard, I lose my hope, but the hope is the thing that was gonna get me through it in the first place. You see, the thing that all these characters that we talk about and we walk through experienced is they all experienced difficulty. They all experienced opposition. They all experienced the need to wait. They all experienced a lot of tragedy, but yet they all kept their hope on the Father. They all kept their hope in believing that God was gonna show up because this hope will not lead to disappointment. This hope will not lead to a disappointment. That we can walk in this confident hope of salvation. And you know, when it comes down to this Christmas season, you know, there's always this, this, this season, is this time that we talk about the anticipation of the birth of Jesus. That there's this anticipation that it's happening, that all of creation is waiting, that there's this waiting, there was this waiting that happened and then there's the birth of Jesus and there's this anticipation and with the, the result of his birth, we have new hope. We, we have this new hope that happens. And Jesus, the baby grows up to Jesus, the man. And so many times in his ministry, the miracles that he performed that the Bible often says that he was moved to compassion by the people were the people that were putting their hope in him. How many stories did someone come and say, Jesus, if you're willing, Jesus, will you heal me? Jesus, will you heal my daughter? Jesus, will you heal my son? Jesus, will you make the command? Jesus, can you heal this blind eye? Son of David, can you do something? Like how many times do people say, I have no hope in anything else, but the only hope I have is in Jesus. And he was moved to compassion, and he did it. Many times it was the people who shouldn't have expected any good to happen to them were the ones who went to him with their last hope of maybe something good could happen. Maybe there's an expectation of good. And, and I, I want to kind of end with, with this thought because I've been thinking about this in recent weeks as I've been studying for this. You know, normally if we have one bad thing happen, one, one setback, one issue, we usually can recover from one thing. Two things happen and it can be a little harder. But sometimes in life you can go through what seems like a season of setback after setback after setback after setback. And not just in one area. 
you have a financial setback, then a health setback, then a relationship setback, then your car breaks, then your dog dies, then you have to stop listening to country music because it's too close to home. Like, it, it all just comes together. It all just, like, starts rolling up. It all just rolls up. And then all of a sudden you think, well, I'm, I'm strong enough for one. I'm strong enough for two. But then it's somewhere in number three or four or five, like all of a sudden you realize I'm not strong enough for this. I'm not strong enough for this. And then we give up. We, we, we lose hope. We, we walk into difficult times. And, and I think most people, we would consider that to be Human, that, that, that would be the human response, that there's a weight that you can bear and then there's a weight where it's too much. And, and we understand that and, and everyone's different in what that is. But the thing that I would propose to you based on what our hope should be in and that our hope is not in circumstances but our hope is in Jesus, our hope is in the person and the character of God. If I put my hope in God when everything's great, and I put my hope in God when one thing's wrong. And I put my hope in God when there's two things wrong. And I put my hope in God when there's 15 things wrong. The key to me putting my hope in that expectation, the weight and the burden to carry these setbacks is never on me. The person who's carrying the burden, my hope and my expectation is never on me to be able to carry the burden of this financial setback. My hope and my expectation is not on me to carry the burden of this sickness that hit my family or this, this, this issue. My hope always stays on the one who can carry my burdens. My hope always stays, no matter how many or how few, on looking at the expectation of what God can do. So that whether it's one or many, I can continue to place my hope in him and I'm never overwhelmed by the sometimes the waterfalls of life that sometimes come because my hope and my, expect, my expectant waiting is never on me. It's always on him. And I think that's why Paul can be singing in prison and Paul can be singing after he's been beaten and Paul can write letters even in prison is because no matter how many setbacks he had, his hope was never in him. His hope was ever always in Jesus. And I know it's easy to get overwhelmed when things can get, I've, I mean, I've been there, I've been there where it's just like, man, can anything else break in my house? Can any other appliance go out at the same time? And you just get frustrated about it. I remember there was a season where like Pastor Andrew, like every major appliance in his house died, I think. His like fridge, his stove, his washer and dryer, it was like everything. It's like a moving sale at his house. And it's just getting you frustrating, but you know what? My encouragement for you tonight as we close, as we, we move on, and we, we end this, this concept of hope, and we, I want you to carry this concept of hope through this whole Christmas season, but, but even past, is where are areas in your life that you've stopped hoping? What are the areas in your life that because of the circumstances, because of the consequences, because of history, that you've stopped hoping? waiting for God to show up. You've stopped anticipating or believing or expecting that God is gonna do something good in that thing, that relationship, that finance. Like, wh what is it? What is it that because you feel like there's been so many failures or so many setbacks that you've just quit anticipating? You've just quit expecting it. You just thought, well, God must have left me on that. Because I'm just here to remind you tonight don't give up hope. Don't give up hope. It, it, it's not over. It may feel like it's over. Everything around you may look like it's over. But it's not over. It looked like it was over for Abraham. It looked like it was over for Job. It looked like it was over for David. It looked like it was over for Paul. It looked like it was over for Jesus. But Jesus never expected anything other than goodness from his father. And so when he went to the cross, he never expected anything other than resurrection because he understood the goodness of God. And so I just want to remind you in a season that we get to look at hope, I want to remind you, don't give up hope. It could be a dream, it could be a relationship, it could be financial, it, it, it could be goals, it could be anything. 
Don't give up hope. Don't, don't give up expecting God to show up. Don't give up on expecting to see his goodness in every single area of your life. Father God, thank you so much for today. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the hope that we have in you. Lord, I, I thank you that we have so many great examples of people who carried hope in their, their hearts. And that hope sometimes associates with waiting and that, that waiting sometimes can be hard and, and waiting can lead to the point where we sometimes get disappointed. But Father God, today and in this time, we put our confident expectation on you. We expect to see something good. We expect to see you show up. We expect to see your provision. We expect to see miracles. We expect for dreams to come true. We expect for the things you've placed in our heart to come to fruition. We expect for relationships to be restored and health to be maintained and, and, and finances to prosper. We expect to see you in these things, Father. Not because of how good we are, but because of how good you are. Not because of our history, but because of your history. Not because of our track record, but because of your track record. Not because of, of our perfect life that we live, but because of the perfect life that Jesus lived. That we expect to see your goodness in every area of our lives. And Lord, for the people who are here today, that maybe. They've given up hope in something. Maybe they've convinced themselves that it wasn't, wasn't meant to be, that, that they, they, they've made too many mistakes. Father God, I just speak hope. I speak hope. I speak hope to that relationship. I speak hope to that body that's broken. I speak, I speak hope and healing to families. I speak hope to lack. I speak hope to depression, I speak hope, to sadness, I speak hope. The hope that can only be found in Jesus, our hope for glory. That even, that we could be, it could be said about us, Father God, that, that even when there was no reason to hope, we hoped in you. Because we believe in your goodness. We believe that we see your goodness here. And we're so thankful for that. I just pray that everyone here tonight, Father, as we leave this place, that we could leave filled with your love and filled with your hope. And that we can carry that hope and be ambassadors of hope, be prisoners of hope that we can share with a world that desperately needs an expectation of good as opposed to a constant fear of failure and evil. We thank you for that opportunity. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen and amen.